Ambassador Bellamy, thank you very much for your opening remarks and for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to come to uh, National Defense University and, and to speak with all of you. At one point in the previous century, I would spent some time in the United States Army, and so it's always a, an interesting occasion for me to come back to leave the academic university, George Washington University, and come back amongst soldiers and firing cannons. As I, as I heard this morning. It's uh, also a pleasure for me to share uh, the stage with Jonathan and Eric, um, both of whom are leaders in the field of media development, information development, governance, accountability in Africa and beyond. So uh, really, really must be said that I'm the author of a report, but they are the people and the sort of people who inform what I know. So this is an opportunity for me to yet once again learn um, from, from both Eric and, and John. Oh, I need to begin my talk by just sort of giving you a bit of the conceptual background that I bring to the question of what does it mean to have this explosion in technology and connectivity in Africa? What does it mean in terms of governance? What does it mean in terms of accountability of transparency? There are academic conceptual, uh, or an academic conceptual framework that helps us think about that in a systematic, shareable way with other people who are interested in the same sort of topic. So what I will be discussing very briefly, just, just touch upon, is that principal conceptual framework of transaction costs and how transaction costs lead to the possibility of creating new kinds of organizations, new efforts, at accentuating either opportunities for development, opportunities for accountability, opportunities for greater degrees of transparency. All of these are potential benefit, whether you're talking about economic development, accountability, security. For the most part today, what I'll be doing is focusing on security aspects of what ICT does in, in Africa. This is echoing Ambassador Bellamy's point. One of the things that we need to begin with is to just get a sense of how great the change has been within the last few years. What you have here are several trend lines. The key one for me is the one with mobile broadband uh, subscriptions from 2000 to 2010. This, this data point is from about halfway through 2010. The ITU uh, with the UN will end up coming with new figures fairly soon. But you can see that one of the true growth lines globally has been in mobile telephony subscriptions. Whereas, if you were to look at fixed phone lines, as the ambassador said, we remain pretty much flat. They've actually rose to a midpoint in about 2005, then they are dropping back off again. So that's, that is sort of one indication, but this is a global indicator. If we were to uh, step back for a minute and just look at mobile cellular subscription by level of development, again globally, if you look in 2000, you had a total of uh, 719 million mobile phones around the world about 10 years ago. If you jump forward though to the halfway point, 2005, you can see that the proportion between the developed and undeveloped world share of mobile phone subscriptions began to reach parity uh, about six years ago, seven years ago. And then if you step forward one more time, you're up to 5.3 billion mobile phones. So in the span of 10 years, you go from a little over 700 million mobile phones to 5.3 billion mobile phones. And then more importantly, I think in many ways, is the point that uh, the proportion of mobile telephony is not found in the developed world, but in the, in the developing world as the UN understands it, that term. If you focus, and, and the graphs will come to an end, this is the last one, I, um, graphs only tell part of the story, but this isolates the growth specifically to Africa, and you can see between two, uh, 1998, in this instance, the trend line begins in 1998, ends in 2008, this, if anyone knows of more recent data on mobile telephony growth in Africa, I'd be happy to, to see it. But you can see that beginning in about 2004, the growth rate in mobile telephony in Africa simply began to skyrocket. Uh, a lot of that growth is the responsibility of entrepreneurs from Africa like Mo Ibrahim, who led the way in developing the, the uh, mobile telephony business in Africa. Uh, so, so much of this growth comes from entrepreneurs in Africa bringing a needed service 
bringing something that would be a benefit to, to people across Africa. Uh, my question is, as a political scientist, what does this mean for collective action? What does it mean for politics? What does it mean for governance, security, economic growth and development? All of those kinds of governance issues are affected by, in my view, by the ability for people to communicate. Furthermore, it's important for us to keep in mind that the nature of communication is very different than what we might have been looking at, say, 10 or 15 years ago, where it was one to many communication patterns. So it was a radio station communicating to many people in a large audience. In this instance, we're creating a network of people who are able to communicate with one another, are able to create essentially uh, uh, networks of information sharing, information distribution that is many too many. So it's a, it's a very different political information dynamic at play. When you travel about Africa, you see evidence of the reach of mobile telephony everywhere in some of the most remarkable and surprising places. I took this photograph with the Maasai community uh, somewhere in Kenya or Tanzania, as I always point out when I showed this slide, I really quite frankly wasn't entirely sure where I was because they're pastoralists and they go back and forth between the border. But, but the key here is, is that this particular gentleman is living a very traditional Maasai life, but he ha has an added accoutrement of a cell phone on his belt. And, and this is not an uncommon phenomenon. It's not an uncommon sight at all. Uh, this is in, uh, I believe it was in North Kivu. North is South Kivu. Uh, in the DRC, um, west of Lake Kivu, and you can see here that these particular gentlemen are trying to use a mobile phone, and, and you know you get clever if you're an AT&T customer here in Washington, D.C., or a cell phone user there, you have to find just that sweet spot in order to get a signal and use the phone, and when you find that spot in the village and the location, you can do things like put a post there and say, put your phone here, turn on the speakerphone, and and you have connectivity available. This is a very remote part of the Congo, but yet the reach of telephony goes into these areas as well. One of the other indicators that you have of the new reach of telephony simply has to do with the branding wars that are going on between the various cell phone companies. This is in Goma in the Congo, and whether it is, in this case, Vodacom, or in this instance, this is a joint op, this orange building indicates a joint um, uh, jointly owned and operated company between the Congo and the Chinese, um, Tigo, etc. Almost all of these um, uh, communities throughout Africa are, are now painted in these competing colors of the various cell phone providers. But it isn't just cell phones. That's one of the key points that I try to bring out in my study. When we're talking about the effects of information communication technology, we need to be aware also of the reach of radio. Radio is extraordinarily important, and what we find is, is that radio and cellular telephony are operating together. Let me just point to one of the places where I see that very clearly evident in the Congo. It involves MANUSCO as well, the UN mission in the, in the Congo where between radio and cell phones, MONUSCO and, uh, is, and some of the NGOs are trying to create greater opportunities for both accountability and the kind of transparency that would lead to greater security amongst the citizens who are dispersed over a very large remote territory. But the way they do that has to do with, with either seeding or placing in the hands of villages or simply taking advantage of the fact that phones are in the hands of villagers in these remote areas and tying those together in an early warning, early response network that is, that is run in part and operated by MANUSCO out of Goma in the, in the Congo, where it works in a couple of different ways. If there is a threat emerging, villagers can call in that threat to either a radio station, one of the community radio stations in the area, and allow the radio station to alert the citizens that this threat is emerging, or alternatively, MANUSCO itself can, has a 24-hour, at least last I knew it was a 24-hour call center where a villager could call in a threat. One of the problems with many of the South Asian troops that are involved with MANUSCO is, is that they don't speak the local language, so one of the other functions is to have a translator there at the call center so that a local villager calling into the Manusco call center in, the, in Goma will have, be able to have his or her concerns translated into a language 
that the peacekeeper there in that facility would be able to understand. So you, you see here, as, Eric, uh, as Ethan Zuckerman of the Berkman Center points out, you have the creation of essentially an information environment that combines both radio and cellular telephony that allows people to share information having to do with what they need for their security, their well-being. This is an essential new element for creating at least the hope, the potential for greater degrees of security in places that desperately need it. Uh, and this is a, a photo I took of one of the community radio stations outside of Goma in the, in the, in the Congo. They're very rudimentary systems, uh, but they are extraordinarily important to the community. The other point that I want to make is, is that when we're talking about, again, technology, we're not talking about just mobile phones, we're not talking about just radio, we're also talking about some fairly esoteric items that I won't go into because of the lack of time in my talk here today, but even if you were to consider the impact of of um, geo-rectified geospatial data. In other words, satellite imagery that not only gives you a picture of something on the ground from 420 miles in space with a resolution as little as 32 centimeters across, it also gives you very precise geo-rectified data that allows people like Jonathan and others at Ushahidi to have platforms that say, I just saw this thing happen in front of me. I'm going to let Jonathan speak to Shahidi and, and to Swift River, but uh, just to give you a sense of it, it uses geospatial data of, taken from space by commercial satellites to actually pinpoint and locate events using mobile phones, using other ways of reporting events that give rise to a greater degree of potential security and accountability that it would otherwise simply be impossible to achieve. So again, when you're speaking to ICT, uh, it's more than just one technology. It's several technologies that come together and inter interact with one another. One of the things that it happens because of information and communication technology is the nature of tackling problems changes. If you have available to you information that's brought to you because of distributed network of information platforms, whether they be cell phones, radio stations, or satellites in space, the nature of the organizational structure that is required to tackle problems changes. The economists speak of a lowering of transaction costs. What they mean by that is, is that rather than building large, complex, hierarchical organizations, what you can do instead is distribute functions out over a network platform, rather like if you're familiar with the notion of network-centric warfare. It's the same idea but applied to civilian purposes, applied to development purposes. You can end up achieving goals and objectives without the necessity of hierarchical organizations. Let me offer you an example for those handful of us who you know, I see in the audience who are about as old as I am. Think about what it was like to check out a book or to buy a book in 1975. Going to a library, looking at this thing called a card catalog, writing down a number, schlepping up to the shelf, finding the book that probably was mis misplaced somewhere, bringing it back down, checking it out. That library is a complex organization that was created in a time when there was a particular cost of information, a particular transaction cost involved. Now, you went to buy and see that book, most likely you have a device in your pocket where you enter it in, Google has a product now, I speak into my phone, and the book will be produced that moment, either by purchasing it from Amazon or simply given to me in a digital format. That takes out the hierarchical structure. I'm utilizing networks to achieve the same objective. That's the idea behind providing security through network platforms that leverage the power of mobile telephony and other technologies that are now available in, uh, in Africa and elsewhere in the world. I'll follow up with that. I don't need to read into more of my time. Thank you very much.